everyone. I'm here for one of my stories. This is Lindsay Dunn. And today I'm here to interview Christian Taylor to talk about her documentary, The Girl Who Wore Freedom. Christian Taylor is an actress, casting director, coach, director, producer, and screenwriter. Christian began her career in the entertainment industry, interviewing senators on Capitol Hill with the TV radio department of the Senate. The Girl Who Wore Freedom is her directorial debut. She is also a regular guest on the fabulous podcast, The Holy Post, I am. which is how I first encountered her and the host of the documentary first podcast, which follows Christian through the process of making her first documentary and ups and downs of it all. Christian, welcome to one of my stories. Thank you very much. So happy to finally see you. We've corresponded a lot uh, in email and over Instagram. I think it started maybe. Anyway, it's so nice to meet you in person, quote unquote. <laughs> yeah, Zoom, Zoom person. Yeah, Zoom person. <laughs> so there's so much we could talk about, but I think I will start with you where I start with everyone. Before you were a filmmaker, you were an actress. And what drew you to that field originally? When I was 10, I went to a performance of West Side Story, which was in my hometown of Laurel, Mississippi. And I was just blown away. I'd never been to a live you know, play or musical at all. And when I saw that, I said to my mom, I wanna be an actress. And um, that was the way it was for the rest of my days, as far as I can remember. I still you know, have dreams of holding an Oscar for you know, some sort of role in the future. <laughs> When I had a chance to focus on acting, I uh, you know, didn't hesitate. My parents sent me to a boarding school in Long Island, New York called the Stony Brook School. And they had an incredible acting program there. So for all of my time at Stony Brook, I participated in their uh, theatrical arts society and doing a play you know, three times a year till I graduated. And when I graduated, I went to the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC and majored in theater. And after that, I did a national tour with national players uh, where we toured all over the country. I was Muriel the Goat in George Orwell's Animal Farm and Hero in Much Ado About Nothing. You know, things happen. And I ended up getting married and having a child and taking about 15 years off uh, from any sort of entertainment, anything. So mm -hmm. that was how it started. But you were probably still using your acting chops at home, like reading uh, books to your kids. You know what? That's exactly right. I did. I read them and it always had different voices for the characters. And um, it was it was always a longing in my heart to do something creative. And being a mom was a real challenge for me because um, it was hard to find that creative outlet. So I did things like um, help at church with any sort of reading of scripture or plays they did. And I um, you know, I tried to just find find anything. I did a lot of creative memories <laughs> for a while. That was a big thing in the 90s. Um, and so I just, um, you know, was hoping one day I'd be able to do something. And on one of my birthdays, I think when I turned 40, my husband said, I want you to do uh, what you love to do. And he started buying me uh, voice lessons. Actually, it had to be when I was 30 because I've been at this for a while now. So I started doing voice lessons so I could do voiceover at home and still be a stay-at-home mom. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the gigs you got doing vo voiceover? Well, nothing super famous. I think the um, I did a, a SAG national commercial where I was the voice of a sleep aid, and that was my biggest one. Um, you know, I've done things for Nazine, which is like Pac Pepto-Bismol, a lot of commercials. And it wasn't until my documentary that I uh, happenstance, this, you know, uh, narrated. It was supposed to be Peter Coyote, not me, but that's a story for later down the road. Um, I really was focusing on uh, commercials and industrials for companies. I would record their training videos or things like that. Um, and I did a lot of on-camera acting as well. Eventually, I went to print work and I went to on-camera work. And so I did some background work and small little tiny parts in movies you've never heard of, like Fancy Pants, which is a wrestling, you know, movie. And um, 
yeah, I just was doing whatever I could to be in the entertainment industry. And in doing that, I met a lot of people um, that wanted me to be on their projects. And so I would help them on their projects. And I learned that I was pretty good at producing. And so I started developing that skill. That skill is a lot like being a mom. You're managing time, money, people, schedules, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff that you know, we're honing my skills for that producer role. And I didn't even know it. So it's interesting that, I mean, I know this is in your profile, so maybe you didn't write it, but the thing about you interviewing senators as your first foray in the entertainment industry, I'm not sure the average American would agree that that is, you know, would be entertainment. So why do you think of it that way or do you? And what lessons, the bigger question I have though is, what lessons maybe did you learn from doing that that you still find valuable today? Sure, it, it was unique. Um, my father went into the Reagan administration in 1980 and for my summer job, he uh, helped me get a job at the Senate Republican Conference on Capitol Hill. And I had no idea what it was, but it was the radio and TV arm of the Senate, Republican Senate. And I at first was just a, you know, go get this bag and go get this cup of coffee. Yeah, that was sort of my role. But I showed that I had a knack for asking questions. And I always have been a super curious uh, person, especially as a little kid. I remember in first grade, my teacher uh, giving a note in my first report card. She asked too many questions and she talks too much. That was in first grade. Um, and it's true. I've just been a naturally curious person and really have questions that, um, that most normal people would have. And I think that's why I, it works well for me on the Holy Post. I'm sort of the everyman that's always asking questions. And with, um, with this crew that I would travel around with, we would go and interview them for the latest bill that they were working on or the latest thing going back in their state. We would ask them these questions, we would record the interviews, and then we'd send it off to the radio and television stations in the state of that senator. And it, I, the skills that I developed were asking questions, but I also think, to me, these people were not anything they weren't famous to me, they were just people. I was 14 years old and I didn't understand, you know, how unique and special that situation was. I just thought, you know, any, any high school kid or middle school kid could do this. And they didn't seem very remote. So there was really no barrier. I wasn't afraid. I didn't see them as these big famous people. I treated them like regular people and I think that served me well, as well as, you know, thinking critically about questions to ask of whatever the cultural thing was happen, happening mm -hmm. at the time or political. So you didn't necessarily, you weren't like an expert on politics. No, I, I had been steeped in it. So my dad ran for offices and I campaigned a lot. And um, I think I had been brainwashed in a sense, you okay. know, in, in this um, one way of thinking. I was, until I got older, I never critically looked at politics, I would say. And I was just on the, the Republican uh, train and I never really thought more about it until I got older of what I really thought and what I really believed. Let's talk about The Girl, the girl Who Are Freedom. <laughs> Give us a brief synopsis of the film because not maybe some of my viewers won't have watched your movie yet. Sure. Well, it's a 90 minute documentary and it is the story of D-Day, but from the perspective of the French. What was the inspiration for making the film? In 2015, my son Hunter was in the army and he had done really well in some soldiers of the year competition. And he was headed to a, a much bigger soldier of the year competition, I think for the brigade, if I recall, or the division, I'm not quite sure. But he, uh, they changed the requirements right before he was about to compete. And he had to have a certain class that they had not sent him to. So he didn't have the class and was disqualified. And that was very upsetting to his leadership. It was upsetting to Hunter as well. And they gave him a consolation prize. And again, I'm using air quotes 
um, of going to Normandy to represent the 101st in the D-Day ceremonies there. Every year, and I had no idea about this, Normandy has been celebrating their liberation since 1945, and they always invite the units that participated in their liberation, and they just give them a big month-long party to thank them for, um, for what they did um, 77 years ago. So when Hunter called me, he said, Mom, the Army's sending me to France. And I said, we're going to France? And he said, you're not going to France. I go, oh, really? Well, I'll meet you there. And, uh, you know, there was nothing that was going to hold me back from going to see whatever he was going to do over there. And so I went along with another one of my sons to see what was going to happen. And when I got there, um, I was blown away. Um, he told me that I had to meet him in the town of Carenton, somewhere where they were doing a parachute drop. Of course, I had never really been out of the country. I didn't speak the language. I had no idea how to drive, you know, in another country. Um, but you just don't think about those things. I bought a plane ticket. I got, you know, I got on a train. I headed out to Normandy, rented a car, and tried to find out where he was. And... I, we were driving around, my son Jacob and I, and we saw this Willie's Jeep. And I had thought that Hunter was going to go back and, um, you know, he was going to reenact what happened. I really had no idea what he was going to do. And so when I saw this Willie's Jeep, it broke down right in front of us. And I was like, oh, Jacob, go out and ask them if we're going, you know, to the right place, you know, is the parachute drop up ahead. And so I see him out there talking. He gets back in the car and I was like, okay, well, are we headed in the right direction? He goes, mom, I have no idea. They don't speak English. They all speak French. And I was so blown away because they were dressed like American GIs. They look just like our American boys um, driving an American Jeep. And it was the first time I got an inkling of what happens in Normandy. Um, we did see parachutes right about that time. And so I just went in that direction, parked my car. And there is a, a very um, important lane in Carenton called Purple Heart Lane. And it's where we lost so many men of the 101st um, in a battle to take Carenton. And... I was walking along this road and I saw this big airborne screaming eagle flag like cutting down through the middle and I saw Hunter and his little unit and they were you know dressed in their normal fatigues and they people were stopping them to take photographs they were asking for their autographs and I was like what is going on um, and everywhere around me Glenn Miller was playing and people were dressed like civilians in the 40s and it was really blowing my mind. Um, and I felt like I had gone back in time, that I was just on Main Street America. There were American flags everywhere. Um, and right about the time that I, you know, greeted Hunter, a woman walked up and said, excuse me, may I take a picture? And I was like, absolutely. I'm his mom. I'd be happy to take the picture. And so I took the picture and she said, this jacket that I was, um, that I have on was given to my mother in 1944 by an American GI. And I said, are you kidding? And she said, no, of course. And I said, is your mother still alive? And she said, why, yes, she's right here. And she introduced me to her mother and to her father, Jean-Marie, who was seven on D-Day. And I happened to be filming at the time. Um, and I just handed the camera to my son, Jake, and I said, can you tell me what you remember about D-Day? I'm um, so thankful that I was filming at that time. That video is now on our website as the first meeting. And I learned that both of them were alive. They have vivid memories of what it was like to be occupied and liberated. And I was just blown away by these people. And we took pictures and we said goodbye. And I thought that was the last I was ever going to see of Danny and Jean-Marie. And we went through the day. Most people don't know in Normandy, a day is filled with celebrations from the beginning of the day to the end. And in this day in Carenton, you follow what the army did that day. So you start on Carenton uh, Purple Heart Lane where they had the battle. And then the next ceremony is in the town by the town hall, like once they had conquered the town. Um, and there is a ceremony there. And then from there, you go to the next ceremony, which is uh, at the port and it's there's a garden party. And um, you just walk through the whole town, you know, participating in these ceremonies. Oh, and I forgot the Cabbage Patch. The Cabbage Patch is in there as well. Another um, bloody battle that um, 
we, you know, we eventually won. Um, and when I got to the town hall for that ceremony, I was jockeying to find a place to watch Hunter. And we ended up right next to Danny and Jean-Marie once again. Mm -hmm. And it had been, there was a ceremony in between the two where I saw them. So we were so surprised to see them again. And at that point, they just adopted us. They took us in their arms and walked us to the garden party and introduced us to all of their friends. And from that moment on, for the next four days, we were with them. And they took us all over their towns that they grew up in, Carenton and St. Marie du Mont, and told us their family stories. And I remember getting on the plane as I was flying back home and I sat next to Jake and I looked at him and I go, what just happened? I, I we have been in Normandy for four days and we did not make it off Utah Beach and Carabao mm -hmm. because our whole experience was really about Danny and Jean-Marie's experience. And um, so I was just smitten with this story and now we had these dear friends and Hunter said when we left, if you're ever in the United States, you have a place to stay. And three weeks later, I get a phone call from Flo Boucherie and said, I'm coming to the United States. Can I stay with you for a month? <laughs> and we, of course, <laughs> said yes, although we thought it was really long. And she goes, don't worry, it'll be fine. I'll make you French food. And you should never invite a French person over uh, to your house unless you're willing for them to stay three to four weeks. And uh, But I would never do have it any other really bonded during that time. It was Christmas of 2015. Uh, she got to see an American Christmas and it was very special. And during that time, I learned a lot more about her family. And I began diving into this story and thought somebody really needs to tell this story. And I tried to find friends that were in the business to be like, you guys need to tell this story. And nobody really took me up on that. So I was like, well, I mean, how hard can it be to make a documentary? I'll I'll give it a shot, and that was the beginning in um, in 2015. Wow, you must have been so overwhelmed. I mean, I can just I mean, as I'm listening to you, just thinking about you meeting these people and just being swept into the story, and then in a way, they were like sort of taking over your life and saying like, "We're gonna take you here and here," and of course, it's a fabulous experience, but it doesn't sound like maybe you got much rest. No, right. no, 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 no. Every night, every night went till 12 or 1. And you have to remember, I was still fighting jet lag. I mean, I think I was only there for four or five days. It was not very long. Um, it, it was just a whirlwind of activity and meeting people. And not only were we doing that with Danny and Jean-Marie, but Hunter had ceremonies to do. So at every place, he would, you know, do a ceremony with the honor guard, and then we would go and do another thing. Mm -hmm. And while we were doing these ceremonies, I was learning the history of what happened, the battles that happened, because at these ceremonies, a French official in French will tell what happened on that place. One of the first ones I went to that I was so impacted by was Angleville en plan which is where there were two medics that took over this church in this tiny little village, and they treated uh, Americans, German, and French. And they told the GIs that they had to leave their weapons outside the church um, or they wouldn't be treated. And so in this church, you had all sorts of soldiers in there, plus French civilians. And two days later, two Germans in the bell tower came down and surrendered to the two American medics. And it was just this powerful story of how the good of the Americans really transformed a little town and saved lives. And those were medics of the 101st. Um, one of the most powerful stories that I have is on that day when Hunter was doing this honor guard, I peeked my head inside the church to see what was going on. And uh, a, a deacon, I suppose, looked at us and said, Du? And, you know, and I didn't really know what he meant. I thought he meant, you know, are there two of you? And so I said, we, and he took us into the church where they were about to start a church ceremony all the way to the front of the church in the choir pews and sat us there right in front of a whole row of, you know, 
101st Airborne Veteran. And I was just, my eyes were just, I mean, filled with tears almost the whole time. But I was wiped out when I heard Notre Père qui est au sur ton nom soit sanctifié, ton règne vienne, ta volonté soit faite, because it was the only thing I remembered from seventh grade French, and it was the Lord's Prayer. Why I remember the Lord's Prayer in French since I failed French, <laughs> I have no idea. But for me, it was a moment that signified I was in a place that I was meant to be from the time I was a child. Mm -hmm. And it was just this powerful, overwhelming experience. Um, and since then, you know, now here we are six years later, I look back at that powerful time and, and I realized something incredibly special was happening. And I've said this no matter where I am, I feel like God called me to this work. And it began at that particular moment. Um, my faith is very important to me. That's probably why the Lord's Prayer stuck in my mind. And I just know, knew that something special was happening at that time. And that's what propelled me forward and kept me focused on what I had to do um, to see this project through, despite the many ups and downs of the project. Just think if you hadn't gotten on the plane to France. I know, I know. About that, Christian? I know. I mean, a mother's love drives us to do crazy things. Um, but in this instance, to follow your heart um, in situations like this, I think is so important because personally, I feel like God directs us through the desires of our hearts. Mm -hmm. He loves us and he, want, he created us in a certain way. And I think we are to be fully who we are. Um, that's the goal in life. And I think to be authentic humans and follow the heart, the heart of the way we are created um, is the pathway to um, real joy in life and to who, you know, becoming who we were meant to be. What was the message you hope to send out to people who watch the movie? Because, I mean, you're talking to me about you met the French, you heard their stories, that was compelling to you, but I feel like the documentary isn't just about that. It is, but yet there's this other thread of the soldiers, the American soldiers that are now at home in our country, in America, and maybe they're looking on their time in France as like the greatest time of their life. And so could you talk, talk to us about those two threads, about the people of France who still celebrate their liberation. I want to hear more about that, but also about the Americans and what maybe, how do those two um, big hearts desires come together for you? Like, what was it, the main message you wanted to communicate? Or maybe there was two messages, but just tell us what you want, what was the story you were wanting to tell? Yeah, I mean, that's what was such a challenge, because when I, I was there, I ended up you know, meeting incredible people, French people that had just heart-wrenching stories. And then I would meet American veterans who had heart-wrenching stories, but had this joy. Um, and I was so curious, how could this gratitude be so great um, if they had lost so many lives at the hands of the Americans? And I really wanted to find the answer to that. And what I was learning, the French taught me something. I thought that I understood freedom. I grew up in this political world. And for me, what I learned freedom meant was I get to do what I want to do. I, you know, I am free to be who I am and to do what I want to do. It was this classic idea of what I am free for or from. But when I talked to the French about what freedom meant, it was a very different thing because they, it was similar in that they also wanted to be free to do what they wanted to do. But their understanding of freedom was much deeper because they had been occupied. You know, they were uh, taken over by the Germans 
they were forced to live on German time. They could not meet in groups. They were every night they had to be in their house by, you know, I don't know what time, seven, eight o'clock. Uh, every time they killed a pig, they had to give the majority of it to the Germans. They, um, they had their guns taken from them. I mean, they, they lost so many things during that time. They were wearing wooden shoes because they didn't have leather or uh, fabric. And they just had such an incredible amount of loss. They couldn't go from one place to another without showing their papers. They were constantly in fear of doing something wrong. When you think of you know, freedom in that context, it takes on a much deep, deeper, richer meaning. And so hearing those stories convicted me uh, that I really didn't understand what freedom meant because I had never been occupied. And so I began understanding freedom as I listened to their stories and looked through their eyes um, at what it was like to live in the early 1940s. And I knew that if I didn't understand that, uh, most Americans didn't understand it either. And that's what I wanted to, to, to show that there is a much deeper understanding of freedom that we need to have. And in going over to liberate these French people, our GIs laid down their lives. They were not afraid. Every veteran that I talked to after Pearl Harbor, they were, we're gonna defeat this enemy, you know, at you know, whatever cost. 13% of our American military signed up then. I mean, that's not an enormous amount. Today, we have less than 1% serving in our military. And since there were so many that were serving, everybody in the country was touched. Everybody either had someone serving or knew an extra neighbor that was serving. It was very personal for everyone in the United States during that time. And they, those boys signed up in droves. I even heard about boys who committed suicide because they weren't able to go in. So it's just a very different understanding of service back then and sacrifice. And it was largely about protecting the world from, you know, this horrible evil. And they acted in such just ways for the most part. There were a lot of bad things that American uh, GIs did. I don't want to sugarcoat it. Uh, they were not perfect. Um, there's plenty of stories of things they did wrong. But, but for the most part, they were very sacrificial. When they came off that beach and they saw Danny and other little waifs uh, you know, lining the streets, they reached into their pockets and gave them whatever they had. Gum, candy, lifesavers, a lot of those things came out of their ration kits. And um, they felt a lot of compassion for these young children that basically had had nothing. And that changed these children's lives. So for Danny and Jean-Marie, their first touch with an American soldier was candy. And they'd never had any of that before. They didn't have, Danny told me when I first met her that her favorite candy was this round candy with lots of colors with a hole in it. And she used to poke her tongue through the hole. Well, we know those as, li as lifesavers, but she had no idea what they were. When I went back subsequently, I took her a whole bunch of lifesavers and that's the first time she'd had them since 1944. Um, so I really um, wanted Americans to have a deeper perception and understanding of freedom. And then the other thing I wanted people to learn in watching my film was I saw how the French people treated the veterans and how it liberated them and how it gave them like, you know, took 15, 20 years off their lives. When they were over there, they were floating on air, high as a kite, uh, happy as they could be. They seemed so much more young than they do in the United States. And I wanted to understand what was happening there. And, you know, through this documentary, I did learn that um, the French people listened to these GIs, these veterans. They listened, they asked questions, they spent time with them. They made them feel like they were important. And that kind of time spent, that kind of uh, desire to know them better is what you know, gave them life. But that's true universally. And that's another thing I learned. It's not just with veterans that we should treat them that way. It's every human being. Whenever we spend time listening to others, when we ask them questions, um, when we invest in their lives, it gives life. Mm -hmm. And I wanted that message to be very clear 
um, in this film. And there's one other thing, it's sort of like a sidebar, but I was blown away that Germans were included in these celebrations. Um, and not only was I, you know, just very surprised about that, when I asked the French people, um, was the reason they were so, you know, exuberant about their liberation, was it because it was so bad with the Germans that they were so happy to be free? And I was told, no, it wasn't. It wasn't this horrible, in Normandy anyway, it wasn't this horrible experience. There were some horrible things that happened, but most Normandy French people would tell me the Germans were correct. And I kept hearing that phrase and I was like, what does that mean? And as I you know, dissected that, what it meant was that the Germans and the French had to coexist. They, the, and the Germans that were in Normandy in particular were old and they had fought in World War I and they didn't wanna be there. They wanted to be back home with their families or they were the infirmed, people who had been wounded or injured and they would go back and you know, recuperate there or uh, they were the very young and they were learning how to be part of the military. Um, none of them wanted to be there. They all wanted to be back home. And so there was this uneasy sort of peace in Normandy during that time. And that was surprising to me um, that, you know, the French people um, could separate the regular army, the Wehrmacht from the SS. Um, because there was a difference. And those are broad generalizations. They're not always true. Um, but that was what I discovered when I was um, interviewing them. And so at some point, not too long ago, uh, Normandy decided it wanted to, it wanted to reinvent itself in a way as the land of peace. And so they extended an olive branch to the Germans to come back for these commemoration stories. And I found that to be um, incredibly inspiring by the French people, honestly. So those are the messages. I know I'm talking a lot. Uh, no, that's but... <laughs> great. You're fine. That's the point of doing an interview, right? For you to talk. True, true. I appreciate the opportunity uh, for you to ask questions and to listen because this story really is remarkable. And I don't have enough time to tell all the backstories in the film, um, you know, but but I appreciate the time so that I could share these stories. I'm sure you had to, to cut a lot of things and make uh, hard choices about yeah. what to include. And some of those extra videos are, are living on your website. This is true. So go ahead and tell people how they can watch the movie and maybe about your website and ways to keep up with updates about the movie. Yeah, so our website is thegirlwhowarefreedom.com. It is a, um, it's a very deep, rich website with lots of things to discover there. We have been doing a blog with stories of GIs or stories of people that worked on the film, um, stories of, of family members who've written things about their, um, you know, family members that served in World War II. So there's some very touching blogs to read. Um, I do do a podcast called the Documentary First Podcast, which is a behind the scenes journey of a first time filmmaker. We've been at it for a little over two years. We've interviewed World War II veterans. Most recently, we've had George Champa, who was a 96 year old veteran who landed on Utah Beach and was part of the Graves Registration Service. Um, his stories are so powerful. He's an incredible man. Um, so I would certainly encourage you to listen to the po those podcasts. Um, we have deleted scenes uh, there on the page, and uh, it's just a great place to explore. Um, you can watch our film um, right now in the United States um, through Apple TV, just by searching The Girl Who Wore Freedom, or on iTunes. Uh, and we do have a link for that on our website. There's a pop-up blocker or pop-up block that says, you know, if you want to watch the film, click here. So there's that, uh, and. If you would like a, um, a DVD, we are right now curating a DVD presale list. And so you can email us at the email on our website, info at normandystories.com, and we'll get an, a DVD to you as soon as we can. Well, thank you so much, Christian, for taking the time to speak to me today to talk about The Girl Who Wore Freedom. I have seen the movie. 
I will be posting this interview online and a link will be included to my review. I do very highly recommend it. So it's a great watch. So if you can, please do go ahead and rent it or buy it and leave a review. And uh, it's been getting a lot of attention on the award circuit, I know. Yeah, so yeah, do we've done before. really well. <laughs> but this is one of my stories, signing off. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye, everybody.